Good afternoon. My name is Susanna Heschel, and I'm the chair of the Jewish Studies Program. And it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Hillel Cohn to Dartmouth as a visiting professor in the Jewish Studies Program this summer. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone to silence your cell phone. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge the death a few days ago of Nobel laureate Elie Wiesel, who was our very inspiring commencement speaker at Dartmouth 10 years ago. His insistence as a survivor of Auschwitz on moral responsibility and his condemnation of indifference has stirred the moral conscience of people throughout the world. For that reason, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the students at Dartmouth who have organized a vigil that is taking place on the Dartmouth Green right now to call attention to the killings yesterday of two African Americans, Philando Castile and Alton Sterling, by members of the local police forces of Minneapolis and Baton Rouge. Given what we study in our courses in Jewish history, we feel a particularly strong concern about the ongoing killings by police of African Americans in the United States. Honoring the tradition of Elie Wiesel, the question of moral conscience and the horror of indifference is being brought to Dartmouth, very much to our Dartmouth discussions this summer term, with the presence of the distinguished former president of Kosovo, President Atifet Yahyaga, who has just arrived here as a Montgomery Fellow. Serving two terms as president of Kosovo from 2011 to 2016, President Yahyaga represents a new generation in Kosovo, bringing democratization and political and moral recovery from the horrors of the war in Kosovo. President Yahyaga will be delivering a lecture in Moore Theater on July 14th that will address the ethnic cleansing that took place during that war, and she will be giving particular attention to the sexual assaults on women as a tool of warfare during that conflict. President Yahyaga, we are honored to have you attending the lecture today. And we thank you for being here. And we also welcome your advisor, Grace Krasar, who has accompanied you. Let me now introduce our speaker, Professor Hillel Cohen. We are honored to have him with us at Dartmouth this summer. He's an outstanding scholar of Zionist history and of Palestinian history. Professor Cohen is Professor of Middle East Studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where he also directs the Cherik Center for the Study of Zionism, the Yeshuv, and the State of Israel. He is here teaching Jewish Studies 40, a course called Jews and Arabs in Palestine, Israel, Past and Present, a class with an enrollment of 51 very lucky students. And he is also going to be teaching the segment on Zionism in Israel in Jewish Studies 11, which has 137 students. I want to express the gratitude of the Jewish Studies faculty to Dean Lynn Higgins and Dean Michael Mastanduno for giving us the funding to bring Professor Cohen to Dartmouth. He is renowned throughout the world for his groundbreaking scholarship. He has worked intensively in numerous archives to reconstruct the history of Arab-Jewish relations in Palestine and Israel, and he is a highly respected figure in both the Israeli and Palestinian academic communities. He's highly recognized for his ongoing efforts to understand both histories and the multiple narratives and political uses of those histories. One reads Professor Cohen's books with surprise. He uncovers new information, even on topics that have been so thoroughly investigated by historians. He challenges the historiographical direction of his field, and he makes us reconsider the explanations we have used in our work because of the breadth he brings to us, which is truly astonishing. In his book on mandatory Palestine, Army of Shadows, Palestinian Collaboration with Zionism, 1917 to 1948, you can hold it up, Bernie. Professor Cohen traces the diversity of relations between Palestinian Arabs and Jews. He traces Arab land sales to the Zionist movement starting in the 1880s and asks whether we might call the ongoing relationships, which were business, personal, political, whether we might call them cooperation, collaboration, or treason. All three terms were used at that time as well as today. Professor Cohen has also revived our attention to the role of religion and he has demonstrated conclusively the religious nature of Palestinian and Zionist movements already in the 1930s and 40s and much earlier. Whether fighting against the British, the Zionists, or against internal Palestinian oppositions, 
Islamic religious language was invoked in expressions of Palestinian nationalism, a nationalism that was not as strong as a resistance movement needed in 1948, Professor Cohn notes. In another book, Good Arabs, the Israeli Security Agencies and the Israeli Arabs, 1948 to 1967, thank you, he examines how the state of Israel, once established in 1948, ruled over its Arab populations. Professor Cohn traces the activities of state institutions from the domestic intelligence agency, the Shabak, to the consultants on Arab affairs for the government and military drawn from the professoriate. The varieties of Arab populations, Druze, Christian, Muslim, Bedouin, townspeople, villagers, nomads, were not unified but highly diverse. How the state of Israel maintained intelligence, how Arabs responded to being under the rule of an enemy state, and especially the role of Arab collaborators and informers, all this forms the core of this very important study. And indeed, it is a breakthrough work in the field of Palestinian historiography, the first major study of Palestinian collaboration. Within the field of Israeli historiography, the book is also a breakthrough. While the new historians establish narratives that contextualize the history of Zionism in Israel within international developments, they did not, for the most part, include Palestinian history except as a construct of Zionists and Israelis, whereas Professor Cohen gives a human face to the Palestinians and offers us an understanding of Palestinian history, culture, and political perspectives on Zionist and Israeli developments. I mention in passing his book, The Rise and Fall of Arab Jerusalem, which appeared a few years ago, and then finally turn to the book that he will address this afternoon, Year Zero of the Arab-Israeli Conflict, 1929. This book makes a strong and convincing argument that it is not 1948, but 1929 that marks the breakthrough year, a year of violent riots by Arabs against Jews and Jews against Arabs in Jaffa, Jerusalem, Sfat, and Hebron. What motivated the riots? What exactly happened in each case? How were the riots reported in local newspapers? How were they subsequently remembered? And how were these events manipulated politically in the following years down to the present day, motivating further acts of bloodshed in the name of honor and revenge? What scholars appreciate is complexity. There are no simple conclusions, no simple moral judgments, particularly not in this arena. As my colleague, Professor Zachary Braderman, writes in an article about Dr. Cohen, what I take from the book is the utter futility in, of trying to advance one-sided, moralizing conceptions with which to understand the conflict. And so we thank Professor Cohen for showing us the complexities that demand sophisticated analysis and careful, thoughtful conclusions. We welcome him to Dartmouth, and we look forward to his lecture today, The Middle East Historian in Times of Conflict, Writing Year Zero. Thank you very much, Professor Heschel. Thank you very much for everybody who came here. And what I'll try to do now is actually to tell you the story of the writing of this book, meaning how I came to write this book, because you know sometimes, or you don't know, sometimes people plan, or academics plan to write a certain book, and sometimes books are uh, created from the materials that they have in front of them. And sometimes a book, or a certain book, is, I would say, almost created by itself. By itself with the help of the author. So I want to tell you about the, about a document that I, uh, that I found in one of the archives in Israel. It is the Haganah archive. The Haganah is the main Jewish militia or underground during the British mandate. But before I tell you about this document, I want to just to say a few words about 1929 in Jewish Zionist memory. The year 1929 and, and the importance of this year for Jews in Israel or maybe Jews in general. So the year 1929 is known mainly because of the massacre that took place in Hebron. Hebron, very ancient city, the city of the cave of the, the tomb of the patriarchs of Abraham and Sarah, 
of Isaac and Rivka, of Jacob and Leah, and according to the Jewish legend also of Abraham and of Adam and Eve. There was a small Jewish community throughout the years that lived among the Muslim majority. In the year 1929, in the summer of 1929, this small Jewish community was attacked by their Muslim neighbors and 69 Jews were killed in their homes. They were unarmed. They were, most of them had no direct connection to the Zionist movement or the Zionist armed group like the Haganah that I just mentioned. Many of them were in good relations with the Arabs of Hebron. They had commercial relation with them. They had friendship relation with them. But at that Saturday, about half past nine in the morning, hundreds of Palestinian Muslims, Palestinian Arabs attacked the houses of the Jews, the private houses and also the yeshiva, the Jewish religious school, and killed with knives and hatches and stones dozens of Jews. This cruel attack on the Jews of Hebron was I would say the cruelest attack that happened in, Israel, in the land of Israel or in Palestine. Of course, since the beginning of Zionism, but also from in the years prior to Zionism, in the 400 years of Ottoman rule over Palestine, there was no such a case. When Muslims ruled Palestine, there was no such a case of massacre of Jews by Muslims. For the Zionists who, until 1929, many of them believed that they can come to Palestine and settle in Palestine, one would say colonize Palestine, without a strong Arab, Muslim, Palestinian opposition, for them it became clear that this is probably, probably impossible, that the Arabs of Palestine are not going to accept the idea of being colonized by the Zionists. So this event changed the mood and the practices of the Zionists from 1929, I would say, until today, changed their understanding of the environment that they live in, in the sense that they started to believe that the only way for them to live in the Middle East or in Eretz Israel is by having more and more power. And they started to believe that there is no way to negotiate with the Arabs. So in this way, the year 1929 is part of the history of the conflict that every Israeli Jew who has uh, some historical consciousness, this year is very meaningful for him. It's very meaningful for him or for her because of the cruelty also of the murders and it was understood, perceived by Israeli Jews as a symbol to the cruelty of the Palestinians, to the, to that Palestinians cannot be trusted, that they just come out and kill their neighbors with no reason, and thus all the dreams to live peacefully in Palestine are just hollow. So this is what the average Israeli Jew know about the year 1929. And now I come to this document that I found in the archive. It was in the Haganah archive, as I mentioned. Or before I found this, actually I was working on a totally different issue. And I was in the library, the National Library of Israel, and I read from a book of a Palestinian scholar Mustafa Dabbar, who wrote a lexicon 
of the cities of Palestine and the towns of Palestine and the villages of Palestine, a kind of geographical, historical lexicon. And in this book I found, I read four lines which were something like, and in the summer of 1929, a Jewish policeman entered an Arab home in the city of Jaffa and killed the whole family, kids, parents, in cold blood. I was quite shocked. I was quite shocked because the year 1929 ha had, for me, very simple meaning. I knew what is 1929. I was at that time, after my PhD, I wrote my dissertation about the mandate period, about these years of the 20s and 30s. I believe that I know more or less what happened in 1929. And I started to ask myself, is it true? Is it true that a Jewish policeman entered this house and killed the kids and the women? If it's true, why nobody told me about that? So maybe it is not true. I photocopied this page from the book of Mustafa Dabar and put it in a drawer in my office. I don't have office, but for the story. It was in the desk of my home, in the kitchen. I work in the kitchen, actually. <laughs> Two years later, I was working on totally different matter in the Haganah archive. And in the Haganah archive, I found a testimony, a testimony of one of the Haganah officers who wrote that in the year 1929, uh, a Jewish officer killed a Palestinian family in the town of Jaffa and was sentenced to death. And he and his friends from the Haganah bribed the British judges, actually they, br they bribed the British attorney in order to rescue him from the death penalty that was imposed on him. Okay, okay. So the story that I read from the Palestinian source is true. There is a story here. So I said there is something here that I want, I want to, to dig a bit more. But before I dig a bit more, I st started with, I would say, kind of reflection. And the reflection was, look, Hillel. I call myself Hillel, not Professor Cohen. <laughs> look, Hillel. When you read this story, facts, when you read about this event in a Palestinian source, you didn't take it seriously. When you read it in a Jewish source, you take it seriously. It says something about you, about me. It says something about the way me, as a so-called professional historian, read sources and not a very good thing. It's true that we can say that when you read a kind of acknowledgement from the side of the, of, 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 of the villain, it's different than from the side of the victim. This is true. But still, I, I, I felt the difference in my approach when I read Jewish Zionist sources, ah, sorry, and when I read Palestinian Arab sources. So this was a very important lesson for me, and I decided that it will be part of my writing in the future. So I opened my computer and I started a new document. To start a new document is a very important stage when we write books. I opened a new document, and then I started to think what I'm going to write. Will it be an article? Should it be a book? And what about, actually? So my, in this stage, my idea was to write a book about surprising documents. About surprising documents. Why? Because I was so surprised from this document. I said, maybe I will collect another. And I have already some very interesting surprising documents. And I put them and uh, arranged them according to the surprise that 
there in this, in them. But then I caught myself the second time. And at that time I said, look, who would be surprised from this document that a Jewish policeman killed a Palestinian family? Me, as an Israeli Jew, I, I was surprised. That's true. But would a Palestinian be surprised to hear that Israeli security forces killed a Palestinian family? Of course, there is no surprise in it. This is what Israelis do from 1929 till present. I don't say that the, why they do it, to what degree they do it. I say that from a Palestinian perspective, when you write about Jewish policemen or soldiers who killed a Palestinian family, this is banal, this is trivial, this is not a surprise. When I understood that, I understood that actually all what I had written beforehand that Susanna told you a bit before my lecture was very deeply rooted in me being a Jewish and Israeli. Now, this is fair enough. I am a Jewish Israeli. But the question that arose was, who am I as a writer? And who are my readers to whom I want to, re to write? And again, this is very, very difficult. Because when we try, when we start to understand that we are prisoners of our views, what can we do? It's not necessarily wrong to be prisoners of our, our views. It's not necessarily a kind of obligation to try to free ourselves from our views, because our views are us. But at least we have to be aware what kind of writing we do, from where do we write. So here, when I realized that, I had to decide if I want to free myself, whether I want to free myself, and what does it mean to free myself. Now I can say that in, among Israeli historians, and again, Professor Heschel mentioned the new historians, we can say that there are different paths for one to free himself or herself. One path is to forget everything about your background. I am not Jew anymore. I don't want to mention names, but people who are familiar with the scene know there are some historians, at least one, they say, I am not a Jew anymore. I don't have any attachment to the history of the Jewish people. There are other people who say, we free ourselves by not trying to free ourselves, meaning we are Zionist Jews and we want to write as Zionist Jews in order to promote the Zionist idea. And this is fine. And this is fine. I tried, of course, not the first one and not the only one, I tried to take a third path. And the third path was and is to continue to hold, to keep to my Jewish Israeli identity very strongly. This is myself. And I want to tell you something that when we speak about history and about who am I as historian, and some people would tell you about these professors that they met in their undergrad school, and some people would tell you about that book that they read when they were in the gradu graduate school. But I think that I can tell about myself, but I believe that this is true for most of us our historical consciousness starts when we are in the age of two, three, four, and five. I can tell about Israeli Jews, I can tell about myself, I don't know very well other cultures. I can speak about what I know. And I know that as a Jew, and if you have other experiences, I would love to hear, the idea of history comes from the Torah, from 
the Holy Bible, the Jewish Bible. The idea, the feeling of history starts from Genesis and from Adam and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And it continues to Moses who freed, who liberated the sons of Israel from Egypt. And then to, Je to Joshua who entered with the sons of Israel to Canaan and then to King David and King Solomon and the first temple and the destruction of the first temple and the creation of the uh, build, uh, rebuilding of the second temple. This is a history that we know before we study history. We have the festival, we have, we have Passover. So we know about Egypt and about slavery. We have the Purim and we know about when we are four years old, we know about, about, about the Persian kings and about the Jews in the diaspora, the first diaspora. So our feeling of history is part of our identity from the very beginning. Before we study, before we study, this is what our parents tell us before we go to sleep. This is what we, our festivals are about. And what I said now about Jews, I know that is true at least for Muslims in the Middle East. Because Muslims in the Middle East, they are told about the, the stories of the Quran before they go to sleep or when they go to the mosque with the parents. So they, again, they know about the sons of Israel and they know about Abraham, which is also the father of the Arabs according to the Muslim tradition. So they know it and they know about Hajar or Hagar. And they know about the prophet Muhammad as a struggle between the Prophet Muhammad and the Jews. So this is also part of their understanding of the world. It is part of the worldview, even if they do not study history in school. Especially if we do not study history in school, we have a certain view about history. So when one speaks about freeing himself from, from what? from all what his parents told him, from all his history, why should one do it? And if one frees himself, what, what is left? The history of the other? The history of the other, what it means for, to me? What does it mean to me? The history of the other. So what I try to do is something different, is to try to write a book in which me, and here it is, again, it is very important. Since I reached the conclusion that every history and every uh, history book and every book is written by a person, and, and, and to detach yourself and to try to be objective is usually, I wouldn't say meaningless because some important people did some important work by doing that. But I felt that it misses something. And I say I felt because I think that our, my guide in this book was the emotions and the feelings rather than analysis or... Uh, so I felt that I want to find another way. At that time, I used to go quite frequently to Hebron. And Hebron today is one of the centers of violence in Palestine, Israel. It is like uh, in 1929, a city with a small Jewish minority of about, about 500 Jews living in the center of the city of Hebron with 100,000 Palestinians, but with military occu Israeli occupation over the Palestinians. So the minority of the Jews are privileged over the Palestinians on the one hand. On the second hand, they are tiny minority and they live in fear. Maybe you heard about the two last terror attacks in Hebron and near Hebron in which one 13-year-old girl, a Jewish girl, was killed in her home in Kiryat Arba, which is the, the settlement of Hebron, a week ago. And a rabbi from Otniel, which is a settlement near Hebron, again was shot to death in his car, in his way to his home. So Hebron is also today a center of violence, and again, when we say violence, we have to know that the violence, of course, is not from one side to the other, but there is violence of both sides. 
each towards its other. So, as I started to say, I, at that time I frequent, frequented Hebron to talk with Palestinians, to talk with Israelis, mainly on political issues, not about history only. But because I am a historian, and because of the memory of the year 1929 is there in Hebron all the time, so I used to ask people in Hebron, Palestinians in Hebron, about the massacre of 1929. And I ask one after another. And I must admit that when I asked them for the first, second, third time, I had a kind of expectation to hear that they regret, that they regret for what was done by their ancestors. But I haven't heard any regret. And I was shocked again. I was shocked again. How come? that innocent people were killed in your neighborhood and you don't care. More or less at that time, there was another Israeli operation in Gaza, bombardment of Gaza by the Israeli Air Force. You know that in the last operation in Gaza, about 350 kids, Palestinian kids, were killed by the Israeli forces. And in Israel, the level of support in this operation was 95% support. I was writing my book. I was wondering about the lack of empathy from the Palestinians in Hebron to the Jews who were killed in Hebron. And I realized that it's not about lack of empathy for what happened in 1929. At the very same time, there is lack of empathy from the side of the Israelis of hundreds of kids who were killed at the very same week in Gaza. So I understood something which is very banal, but I need all this journey to understand the trivial, which is that it is very, very difficult to feel empathy towards your enemy. And we cannot even expect people to feel empathy towards their enemies. I was writing the book, and there was this operation. I was eating dinner with my family. The telephone rang. I went to the telephone. There was a friend of mine from Gaza. He told me that his nephew was in the street, is in the street, wounded from the Israeli bombardment, and they cannot reach him, and he's, go he's dying in the street. I am in Jerusalem, he is in Gaza. I called the Red Cross, I called the Physician for Human Rights. They had teams in this area. They tried to do something. They didn't succeed. I understood that I cannot really distance myself while writing from what's going on in the field while I'm writing. And I understood that it is meaningless to speak about atrocities that are committed by one side and ignoring the atrocities that are committed by yourself. So this was the mood in which I wrote the book. And I tried, while writing, to do something which was not very simple for me, and it was to write the book from different point of views. Now, again, this is very trivial. We do it all the time. But I try to do it at least different from the way I do it in previous years. Meaning that it was not to write from the minds of other people, 
but from the emotions of other people. So when I wrote about the Zionists in the 1920s, the Zionists in the 1920s who came to Palestine in order to save their lives, because their lives in Eastern Europe were impossible. Because they were in danger in Romania, they were in danger in Russia and in Poland, and of course, later on in Germany and other countries. So when I come to <coughs> present it, I have to enter to their minds. It's not very difficult for me, because my mother came from Poland in 1931, because her father understood that Jews cannot stay in Warsaw in the 30s. So this was relatively easy for me to do. My father came from Afghanistan. So it was not either difficult for me to understand the situation of Jews under Islam, because this is what I was told at home. But I had to try to understand what did the Palestinian feel when they saw this influx of Jews into Palestine. It is not a question, this is not the question whether it was just or unjust. Of course, this question is always there. But my question was not, was not part of international relations or international law and this kind of questions. No. It was about the feelings of people who live, for example, in Jerusalem, Palestinians, Arab, Palestinian Arabs who live in Jerusalem. And during the 19th century, they become a minority in their own town. They used to be the majority in Jerusalem. During the 19th century, they became a minority. What did they feel? How can we know what they feel? So we have to read sources from real time to go back to archives, and this is what I did. I went back to archives, to Zionist archives, but also to Ara Arab archives, to memoirs of Palestinians from this period. And the idea was to understand, to understand. And to understand, I mean to understand also murderers. And sometimes there is debate about that. Should we understand murderers? And I say, yes, we should. It is our duty. It is our duty. Because to kill people is part of human nature. And what we study is the human nature and human history. And people all the time kill each other. And we have to understand it. We have to understand why and when they do it. And we have, of course, to distinguish between understanding and justifying. It's not about justifying. It's we, we have to understand. I want to understand the pilot who bombarded kids in Gaza. I want to understand a Palestinian who entered the house in Hebron and killed people that he knew. I need to understand that. Of course, this approach is not always popular, neither among Jews nor among Arabs. Because for Jews, even the question, why did this pilot throw his bombs, is almost illegitimate. Of course, this is self-defense. And for the Palestinians, it's almost the same. Of course, it is self-defense. Because this is a very basic understanding of both sides. The Jews in Palestine and in Israel now, they believe that all what they do is part of their right, even duty, to defend themselves from the enemies. And the enemies are the Palestinians or the Arabs who try and sometimes succeed to kill them. And the Arabs of Palestine believe that they are in a hundred year and more of a struggle for self-defense. Because they used to live in their country, they did wrong to no one, they didn't attack Jews when the Jews were under Muslim rule. And the Jews came to their homeland and decided that this should be a Jewish state. 
And they tried to make and succeeded to make the minority in their own state and to rule them. So they have the full right to defend themselves from these invaders. So both people feel strongly that they defend themselves. And if we try to understand the conflict and we go and listen to a scholar that promote his or her national discourse, it would be very clear that if we hear an Israeli scholar, it is clear why the Israelis have the right to use violence. And if we hear a Palestinian one, we would hear the same. Of course, what I'm trying to do is, again, very simple attempt to let Israelis and Palestinians, to let them if they want, because nobody can force, if they want, that it will, would be accessible for them to understand each the emotions of the others, to understand each the religious <coughs> attachment of the other to this country, to understand what motivates the others, that it is not necessarily evil emotions that motivate them, but it, in many cases it is their attachment to the country, patriotism, his, their willingness to live in dignity, both Jews and Arabs, they actually motivated by the same powers, same forces. So I don't know to what degree, of course, I succeeded, but this was my attempt in this book. And again, one of the main points here was while writing to, f to follow to follow my emotions and my feelings. And I want just in conclusion to add one last observation about my own feelings, if I, if I may. And this is about what I feel when I read in the documents or in the newspapers about Jews who were killed by Arabs and what I feel when I read about Arabs who were killed by Jews. And I realized that my feeling is not the same. My feeling is not the same. I am against killing of kids, be they Jews and Arabs. But when I found in the documents about a, a, a Jewish kids that were killed, or a, a Jewish elders, <coughs> or Jews in general, it almost made me cry in some cases. When I read about cases in which Jews killed Arabs, it made me outraged. And it is not the same, of course. It is not the same. And from this, I realized something for me very, very important. That in Israel and in Palestine, we commemorate our victims, of course. And we commemorate our heroes, of course. And in many cases, our heroes are the people who killed them. And their heroes are the people who killed us. And in many cases, people speak about, about history, textbook, that they create a certain emotions that it is a kind of history that imposed on the people via the Ministry of Education and in other ways in order to make them feel in a certain way. And I understood that this is not like that. But on the contrary, it is the very basic feelings of attachment to your family, your tribe, your nation to make you feel in a certain way. And the official commemorations is another outcome of these very basic emotions. It's not imposed. It's not imposed. This is the nature of people. And this is why we 
have, now I speak as an Israeli, we have sometimes to look at the mirror and to see how we react and how we behave towards our heroes. Back to the person that I mentioned at the very beginning, this Jewish policeman who killed the Palestinian family. He was in a British prison, but when he went out from the prison, when he was released in the birthday of the, of the King the, George VI, the, the he was released. There was a huge, a huge ceremony of respect to him by the Jews of the Yishuv of Palestine. And the same is true for the people who conducted the murderers, the murderers of Hebron. There were and there are until today commemoration ceremonies to them by Palestinians because they are their heroes, not because, because they killed innocent people, but because they risked their life in the service of their nation. So here again, we can see this kind of similarities. Simil similarities, of course, doesn't say that it is the same. And I think that viewing the Jewish-Arab relations that way help us to understand much better the relations from the very beginning of Zionism till the present. Thank you very much. Yes, actually the Arab, Palestinian, Israelis, Israelis, citizens of Israel who read the book were quite enthusiastic about it. I can give one example which may, may, maybe his name is known to you, which is Ayman Ode, which is a leader of the Arab list to the Israeli Knesset, the parliament. So he read the book and for, for him, this is, this is what he wrote me, this is the way to write history, to write history in the way that you at least try to represent, and I'm not trying to represent the Palestinians. I'm trying, while I write from Palestinian perspective, I still do it through my own eyes. But he wrote me that I, it, it, it was done very well and, and other people were, were the same. Now it's, uh, I, I hope the book will be translated also into, into Arabic. Most of my books were translated into Arabic as well. As it, usually it creates a very interesting discussion because People who are more with the idea of creating a shared sphere to Jews and Arabs, of course, they see these books in a positive way, much more than people who, for, for example, from the Islamic movement, the northern branch of the Islamic movement, they like it less. So, yeah. Yes, please, Michael. Um, he was very persuasive and illuminating on the question of this balance between empathy and distance. Portrayed in vivid, obviously, uh, but I did have a, another question, which is uh, the, the balance between empathy and distance usually is in the direction of judgment, whether it's in a legal case or a historical narrative or conclusion of a book or something like that. And the, the case in point, you talked about a third way, your attempt to have a third way. A judge tries to have a third way. Uh, the third way is the way of the sort of resolution of positions or points of view. Well, what about the British records surrounding the Jewish policeman killing the family? Now, I know he, the guy was bribed, right? The judge was bribed. And he believed, but there must have been some records around the case itself. And then you say, well, there's a judgment. The Jewish policeman was a nutcase. He was a desperado. He was a vindictive, evil guy. I mean, did the British come to some conclusion about the nature of the incident itself? And then Yes. Yes, the British sentenced him, sentenced him to death. Yeah, for the British, it, it was clear that he, 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 he did it intentionally and with no reason. 
So they sentenced him to death, and there they, they applied to the higher court, appealed to the higher court, and then, as I, uh, I said, uh, the attorney was bribed, and, 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 and he was sentenced to 15 years in prison. But I want to do uh, j the question about, about the British is very interesting, because there is another case in which a group of Arabs enter a house of Jewish family in the colony of Moza near Jerusalem, and they killed the whole of the family. And they also were brought to court, and they were all acquitted. Years later, the son of the leader of this group wrote memories and interviewed his, interviewed his father. And it was revealed that they were the murderers, but they were acquitted by, by the British court. So the knowledge and understanding of the British was rather limited, I would say. I, I, it was 10 years after the, the establishment of the, the, the system. The, 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 the power was very limited. Their knowledge was very limited. That's very um, Avram Gord always speaks about 1929 um, with a family recollection of an Arab who actually helped save members of his family. I'm wondering if you could give more examples of that so we don't leave the lecture feeling that 1921 was merely, um, although mainly, but not merely, uh, mutual, uh, mutual yeah. atrocities. Thank you very much for this question because one of the most interesting phenomena of, 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 of the massacres in Palestine in 1929 is that in every place that there was a massacre, there were people who rescued each other. So there were in Hebron, which was the center of the massacre, there were dozens of Palestinians who rescued many, many Jewish families. Which is more important than to condemn massacres, they rescued people. In Jerusalem, there were, there were, there were cases in which Jews lynched, committed lynching in Arabs in the streets of Jerusalem. And there were few cases in which Jews saved the life of Arabs in Jerusalem. There was a case in which an, a, a Jewish mob ran after a Palestinian, and this Palestinian entered to a house of an ultra-Orthodox family. The woman was alone at home. She gave him the dress of her husband. So he looked like an, a Jewish rabbi, and this is how she saved his life. So it is true there are many, many cases of, of, of rescuers. And uh, I can tell you that now in, in, in Neve Shalom, Wahat es Salam, in one of a Jewish Arab village in, in Israel, we start to commemorate these events of rescue. Just a point of clarity for you. Am I right in assuming that the Jewish policeman was actually serving in the British mandatory police. It was the, you are 100% right. Yeah, so the British uh, <coughs> executing him or condemning the execution was actually part of the policy of defending their own status. Yes, this is part of it because part of, uh, of, of he was guilty also for using his police arms against uh, the regulation. So this is what's part of it. But there were other cases in which Jews killed Arabs and they were brought to trial, though they were not part of any, any neither British nor Zionist organization, just mob in the street. So. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, I have a question about the Jewish Jews in history. Um, in, you said that you kind of tried to share both perspectives. What my understanding is that, um, like a lot of the pre-1948 memories and archives and like, um, yeah, like street names and things like that had been erased. What? How do you do history in that in that environment? Like, did you rely on like oral testimony? I'm just kind of curious at how you go about that process. Yes, th th this is one of the, the, the most difficult or one of the biggest problems in studying Palestinian history. Because there is a huge difference between Zionist archives and Arab archives. Zionist 
when they, when, they, when they do not buy land from Arabs, they write. And if they buy land, they also write that they bought the land. So all the time they wrote, they wrote, they wrote dozens. Of, so everything, you know, the debates in, in Zionist history are about a certain word that was said by Bel Katzenelson and other leader. Was he near the Kinneret at that time or was he in a kibbutz at that time? I mean, they know everything about every person, what he did when. When you speak about, about, about Palestinian history, the, 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 the Palest most of the, the way history is told by Palestinians is oral. The level of illiterate, I mean, at that time, among Palestinians was quite high. It was more than 60% so, so in, in the villages. So it is true that we, we tend to rely on oral history and stories that were told to people uh, or in projects that were aimed at writing the history or in other, uh, other, uh, other circu circumstances. And there is also a lot of writing of the period which is more political. In the case of the events of 1929, because there were hundreds of people were brought to trial, and we have most of the protocols of the, tr of, of, of the trial in the archives of, of in, in, in London in the British Archive, the British National Archive, so we can hear the stories in their own words from their testimonies in court and other sources like that. Yes, um, so I wanted to follow up on, I mean, you talked about the I appreciate very much that you, uh, you know, rejected the notion of, you know, writing from nowhere, that you're, in fact, real acknowledged that, you know, um, that people write from a, a position and you are straightforward about your position and, and, and all of that. What I wondered is whether the choice of 1929 as year zero doesn't all, also uh, reflect a kind of uh, positionality that, on your account, it's the year in which the Zionist establishment or Zionist sentiment believe, came to believe that negotiation, peaceful coexistence, and so on were going to happen. But it, it occurs to me, and, and you know much more about this, of course, than probably any of us here in the room, so you can criticize this, but it seems to me that other dates that have been proposed, like the Nebi Musa uh, events of 1920, or the Palestinian Rebellion of 1936 to 39, um, would represent, you know, a more Palestinian-centered year zero, that both represented a response to, on one hand, the, the clear outcome of Versailles and all of that, and on the other hand, to the, you know, the, the atmosphere around the Churchill Report and so on. So, uh, I wonder if choosing 1929 isn't itself an act of positionality. Yes, I totally agree with you in the sense that uh, I chose the year 1929 to write about 1929. And the question whether the title is the right title, and I was against this title. I was forced. <laughs> I was forced by, by the publisher, and in the introduction I tell that this is not year zero. So <laughs> this is 100% true. Now in addition, you also write in the sense that it is much more important year from Zionist perspe perspective than from Palestinian perspective. From Palestinian perspective, this is another event in the chain of their active opposition to Zionism, not necessarily an important one. So in Nebi Musa, so you mentioned in 1920, five Jews were killed, and here 133 Jews were killed, half of them in Hebron. This is not of importance for them, because this is, this is another event. Like, like, again, the operations in Gaza of Israel. So in one operation, 1,000 people are killed, in the other 5,000 people, 3,000 people are killed. Okay, so it's, it's the same. So I agree that this is more year zero from a Zionist perspective in the sense that it consolidated the Jewish communities in Palestine into one yeshuv. Thank you so much for that inspiring talk. Um, this is more of a comment rather than a question if I may. Um, you write obviously as a historian, but I just wanted to point out that from a literary point of view, um, what you're trying to achieve can also and has also been achieved. 
The person that I'm thinking of, the author that I'm thinking of, is David Grossman, who writes, in my judgment, very much in the same spirit that you have written and tries to achieve this kind of mutual understanding. Um, you're probably familiar with this book uh, in English called Writing in the Dark. Um, and in that book, I think um, he makes many of the same points that you make, but as a literary uh, figure rather than as a historian. I wonder if you see any parallel between your work and, and his. Thank you very much. I, I, I wouldn't compare myself to David Grossman. I mean, it's, it's, it's too high at this stage of my life. Uh, uh, but I can tell you that my mother passed away before I finished writing the book. And this is the first time that I sent her chapters of my book during writing it, because I felt something, you, you know. And also because she lived in Jerusalem, mandatory Jerusalem, so she knew the streets and she knew the personalities she used to go to the same synagogues that are mentioned in my book and so on. And she told me after she read the first chapter, my son, you became a real author. So this is a kind of answer to your question. Thank you. <laughs> Would you say that your description of the history of the founding of Israel and the uh, concomitant Palestinian movement is sort of new in, in that you have all this information, but this is mirrored in the history of this country. We have a, a history which is not always publicized. We only know the eternal story. So is this really uh, a description of most national movements that have occurred over the history of mankind? And all these atrocities is not new. It's just we hear it now. We have a record. Yes, yes, but you know, when I proposed to my wife, she didn't, told, she didn't tell me, you know, many men propose to many women. <laughs> well, though it is true. So, by the way, she said yes. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say, it, it is true. Yeah, nations are nations, atrocities are atrocities. We try... If we are against atrocities, we try to understand the, them in order to prevent them. There is difference when we are still in the same conflict and we write about it, because here we can try to shape the younger generation, or at least to give them the option to understand the other, because what is going on now among Israelis and among Palestinians, that Israelis are sure that Palestinians are there in order to kill them. This is why they were born for, and they, this is why, what they are taught. And Palestinians believe that the Zionist movement was established in order to kill them and kick them out, or kick them out from, their, from their, their, their country. So I want to tell them, no, this is part of the story, but it is not all the story. So in this sense, it is similar and dissimilar to other cases. Yes. Um. Historians and literary writers are important in this equation, but ultimately it's leadership in the countries, in this case Israel and Palestine, uh, uh, or the Arab countries. Uh, can, can you conceive of, or do you see, any leaders, either historically or contemporaneously, who have or have the potential to adopt your, your way of thinking? I can tell you, political leaders, I don't have any contact with Israeli, and I would even say also Palestinian political leaders, though I must admit that my, uh, I, I, I sat with Abu Mazen, I never sat with, with, with Netanyahu. But, but uh, uh, there is a huge difference between the current leadership in Israel and the leadership in the 30s and 40s. The leaders of the Zionist movement, like Ben Gurion and Moshe Sharet, they were, their understanding of the Arabs was, I would say, rare in, its, in, in, in the positive sense of the word. I, ca I can bring, I don't know how much time we have, I, I can bring you a, 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 a to quote, no, not exactly to quote, to phrase, a lecture that was given by Moshe Sharet 
Moshe Sharet was the second uh, in the hierarchy of the Zionist movement. He became later the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Israel in the 50s, and then he was the Prime Minister for a while after Ben Gurion. He gave, a, and he was in charge of Arab affairs of the Zionist movement during the 30s, 40s, 50s. He gave a lecture in uh, 44, I think it was. And in this lecture, he told the following. It's, it's amazing lecture. Sometimes I think instead of giving lecture myself, just to read his lectures ag again and again, because it is more than brilliant. He explained what the Zionist movement, it, it approach, its approach to, to, to the Arabs. But I want just to mention one point in it. He said, in 1920, he said, 25, 23 years ago, we came by train from Alexandria in Egypt to Jaffa in Palestine. At that time, there was train from, uh, from Egypt to Palestine. And Jews from Eastern Europe, in many cases, came by boats, by ships, to the port of Alexandria, and then by train to Palestine. And these were the days of the third Aliyah. We took the train. It was a night train. We arrived into Eretz Israel, into Palestine, about five, a, 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 a five in the morning. We were a group of about 40 in the wagon, and we started to sing our Russian song about Eretz Israel, about the being pioneers, about rebuilding the land of Israel. He said, in the train stop of Katara, which is a Palestinian town, an old Palestinian, an old Arab fellah came into our wagon. And we were singing, and we were happy. He looked at us. I looked at him. He knew Arabic, Shertok. I looked at him, and I think that I felt what he was feeling. This Arab fellah wake up early in the morning. He went to his Muslim mosque in his Muslim village. And he was thinking to take uh, an Arab train in order to arrive into the Arab city of Jaffa and go to an Arab official in the department of the government, the British department of the government. And then he enter this wagon. He sees us. And he, this is what Shertok says about this fellah, he understands that this country would not be an Arab country anymore. So I don't know if you feel what is going on here. He comes with all his Zionist enthusiasm, Shertok, Moshe Sharet. And he comes with this group of devoted Zionists to come and they purchase land and they want to establish one of their settlements or kibbutzim on the land. But when he sees these Palestinians, he can feel with him and can, in a sense, be sad for him that he's going to lose his homeland. He, it doesn't mean that this Zionist leader gave up Zionism. No, he continued to be a Zionist leader. And he believed that it is very important to bring Jews to Eretz Israel, both because the, the danger that they faced in Europe and because they wanted to build a national home for the Jews. So it's not that he became anti-Zionist, but at the same time, you could feel what they felt. If you look at the leaders, the Israeli leaders of the last 10, 20 years, you cannot find such understanding of the other side. I can add that in the security establishment, and this is very interesting, I would say the highest ranking leaders of the Israeli security establishment. I receive phone, phone calls from them. They read books, my books. They want to discuss it. They invite me to discussions. They, because of their role, they want to understand. 
from different angles. What is to be a Palestinian? For them, it's important, not to the political, po political leadership. <coughs> Examining sort of the history of both sides of the conflict, giving you a sense of that both sides can understand each other, or a sense of helplessness that both sides have legitimate Did everyone hear the question? No. The question was whether uh, it gives me hope or not. I prefer not to answer to this question, <laughs> for obvious reasons. 